Good morning and welcome to Wombs with a View, Maternal Musings with Jenny and Mika. I'm Jenny. And I'm Mika. So today we have a topic for you that even perhaps the title is confusing. Um, and I, I could just kind of picture in my, in my mind's eye watching people open up the ad and seeing the words nipple confusion and having that kind of this this oh maybe I wasn't supposed to maybe I wasn't supposed to look at that so that's the title of our show today is nipple confusion but uh, but first we wanted to take um, to take a moment here and I'll, I'll pass the the mic over to you for a moment here Mika. Thanks Jenny um, so we want to take this opportunity and do uh, land recognition and uh, territorial acknowledgement knowing that we are in Montreal which is also um, located in unceded indigenous lands, which uh, the Kanagiaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of this land and waters, which we are broadcasting from live today. And uh, Chachaga, which is also known as Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. And today is a home of a diverse population of both indigenous and other people. And we want to respect and continue to be um, respecting this land in the past, present, and future, and uh, knowing that our ongoing relationship with Indigenous people within the Montreal community is something that we value and want to honor. Thank you. Thanks, Mika. Um, I mean, obviously, today we're uh, this. This is not the topic of our show, but uh, it it should perhaps be the topic of more things more often. And I can say, um, so Mika, as some of you might know, is not from here. Uh, she moved here within the last uh, decade. Whereas um, I was born and raised in Ottawa, and uh, like a lot of Canadians, hopefully at the moment, are, I'm I'm feeling a little bit. I'm feeling more than a little bit uh, embarrassed and ashamed uh, for a lot of reasons. And this is nothing new. This is just one, you know, one more gigantic, albeit a uh, news story that has hit, of course, um, that we're all very aware of. Anybody who's been paying any attention to anything in the news just keeps coming. Um, I was just reading earlier about um, about the government having destroyed like 15, 15 tons of paper documents related to the residential schools in, uh, in the decades between 36, 1936 and 1944. Um, so, I, I mean, there's there's uh, piles and piles of reasons for us to be in ashamed and, you know, ideas like uh, when we raise flags, etc., cetera, are, are perhaps interesting, but um, for people to be, be living without clean, uh, clean drinking water um, seems a little bit more pressing. Anyway, uh, just putting that out there. I, I, I think, too, to say that, um, you know, we we didn't learn about this. I don't know on your side of the pond or even actually where you were when you were in high school when you would have been learning history, Mika. But in our in our own country, in Canada, we we didn't have this as part of the historical education. And um, I mean, we understand why. I understand why. Um, but it's a shame, and I, I have to say, I'm happy that at least here in uh, in Quebec. Uh, which might be a little bit surprising, but at least here in Quebec, where my kids go to school, they are they are learning. They're having uh, they have a, a class called Philo uh, Philosophy, where they're they're having big conversations come up, and they seem they seem to actually be uh, finally learning the real deal of uh, a little bit of history of what has happened here in Canada, um, and even on this particular subject with the news that has come out. So, uh, even though my kids are only eight and ten, my hopes are that between school and home, they're uh, they're starting to understand a lot more deeply than uh, than I than the information I was given at their age. Yeah, and also acknowledging that it's still happening, and, and that we are part of this present, and we can, by education and learning and being uh, aware of the past and what is still going on, we we can change our relationship um, to that. And yeah, so jumping on today with <laughs> with this and and how important that is for us. So just uh, this conversation will keep on going on. Thank you. So we usually, uh, like all things on this show, uh, and like the subject we're talking about, usually, usually our topics are pretty heavy. There's nothing to be made light of uh, what we're, we were just speaking about. So we'll we'll put that aside for now, and we'll get on to um, we'll get on to talking about boobs and nipples. Ah, we have matching boobs. I didn't know you're supposed to be the exact same 
different colors. So we had these recently <laughs> made and uh, Mika and I, as some of you know, uh, do a lot of things, including uh, hypnobirthing education. But uh, these are the Rock the Cradle. These are kind of Rock the Cradle inspired, aren't they? Mika and I also teach uh, teach classes with uh, Sylvia Otfos and uh, uh, Rock the Cradle um, has kind of similar colors to these. Anyway, so we're going to talk about, about boobs and milk. And, uh, and nipple confusion and actually just just to be fun and, and go into it in a, a light way is there any way would you would you tell the story of this boob in my son and just like when we were talking about it kind of reminded me of when people maybe opened up that ad for the show and they're like oh this is not my subject I'm not supposed to be here in this conversation I'm overhearing I'm overhearing something that doesn't concern me and my son recently had a moment with Mika and this boob would you would you tell that story? sure sure he, he came in and saw this <laughs> <laughs> this boob but he didn't know it was a boob and he picked it up and he started looking at it and I asked him who what this what what is that like what do you think that is and he started to say maybe it's a uh, kind of a pumpkin or what was that I don't remember do you remember it was a pumpkin was? somebody yeah. somebody tried to make a pumpkin Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was right. And then I was looking at him and, and saying mm, but maybe maybe something else and then you came in and you said Think body part. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> it jumped out. Oh no, of first he said, Oh, is it a nose? Okay. And okay. then I took it from him and I said, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? And he he threw the boob. He was having a moment of nipple confusion himself. Um, but of course, <laughs> that's not exactly what we're talking about today. Um, if for not anybody, that confusion. <laughs> not that confusion. Um, but for anybody who has had uh, experience breastfeeding. Or, or maybe even is pregnant and watching the show and please do leave your comments and questions um, we'll we'll just say uh, straight up we're not the lactation consultants Mika and I are however I don't know between the two of us how many years I breastfed for seven years in a row not sure about you five <laughs> so we've got a lot of in in a row years of, uh, of breastfeeding experience and we're both uh, Mika is currently and I used to be a, a support mom with uh, Montreal's Nourrisseurs which is an excellent mom-to-mom uh, -mom peer support group for breastfeeding uh, parents if you're interested and in, in, in need of that um, and then of course we're birth educators and doulas and uh, and postpartum doulas so we we have some experience under our belt we have lots of anecdotes to share with you today um, but just as always to put out there this is you know we're not uh, we're not the experts I would say the experts would be an IBCLC um, but we'll just give you today some stories and some things that we've noticed along the way and some confusions we don't we, we don't really ever have all the answers right I think once you start to claim that you have the answers uh, I'm gonna start ignoring you <laughs> <laughs> and Jenny what is an IBCLC for those so an international, you. thank you, taking that for granted, international board certified lactation consultant. And that is the expert um, that, uh, you know, sometimes they're in the hospital if you give birth. And I was talking to a client yesterday who said, you know, the lactation consultant came into the room and she checked this out, check that out. It doesn't always mean that it is an IBCLC. Board certified means that these women, and I think they're all women for the, well, these, these people, um, I assume Jack Newman. Anyway, um, uh, they're being certified and they're being checked and they're they're constantly updating their knowledge base, which is not necessarily the case for your pediatrician, unfortunately, uh, or, or doctor. So um, they are the experts. They're the ones who are really, uh, aside from if you're having breastfeeding issues, aside from your postpartum doula or your birth doula uh, or your midwife or your doctor or even the nurse from the CLSC, out of that scope, if there's an issue, it's a, it's an an IBCLC that you would like to see, and it's I think it's just phenomenal to know that there's and like it's breastfeeding is so vast and it's such a never ending uh, learning curve. So kind of just giving that a moment to say that there's so much, and often when we teach that in our classes, we touch on it. But there's in every unique dyad, in every unique connection between mom and babe. So it can be a second, third child even where things show up and can create all these challenges that we need to try and understand. And one of those could be nipple confusion. So what, what is nipple confusion, Jenny? I love when you ask me these questions. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for doing this. So uh, there was the nipple confusion that my little Arlo had, but that's again, not what we're talking about today. So we, um, I, I would say as birth educators, we often advise people not to introduce the bottle until breastfeeding is well established. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, the reason for that is we are worried about nipple confusion. We are worried um, that baby is going to perhaps prefer the bottle over the nipple um, because it is most of the time easier to get milk out of a bottle than it is out of a breast, the way that the mouth needs to move versus um, uh, milk usually just kind of pouring down baby's throat. So uh, the idea is to get breastfeeding well established, which means no pain, which means your milk has fully come in um, before introducing the bottle. Yeah, and just an anecdote, it takes 40 muscles in our face to be used when breastfeeding. And I think that's such an interesting mm -hmm. thing to recognize how how much we actually use the tongue, the jaw, the lips, this vacuum that's created and this rhythm that breastfeeding um, needs to kind of be found because when you're drinking from a bottle, it's really easy. All you need to do is kind of move your lips and the milk comes pouring down and there's no pause in bottle feeding. So it's a completely different technique. So if it is, and it and it, it causes problem, and can perhaps and, and often would cause trauma to the the nipple if you're going back and forth. If you think of like Mika said, I'm so happy we have these demos because I was not prepared to to show anything else today. So um, you know, if baby is just right on the very tip of the nipple Ouch. of a bottle, meh. But if you can, if you've ever had a baby tug, if you've ever had anybody tug. <laughs> Sorry, um, just on the nipple, it's incredibly painful, right? And then with breastfeeding, we want the baby to have both lip, top and bottom lip, as well as tongue flanged out to get up and over this entire, whoop, this entire part here so that the nipple is touching the soft palate. Are we gonna get the soft palate of your mouth back there? That's quite far back. So it's it's really, as Mika said, not the same technique. So to go back and forth between those, those two things can cause some problems. But of course, anecdotally, I know for me, and I assume for you too, Mika, the babies we see, some of them, most of them, who actually have, for different reasons, they take bottles, many of them can go back and forth, even from day one. So that's, that's so interesting. And then we have those who, but it's rare, who, who just don't want to go back on the breast once they've tried the bottle and they just, they refuse the breast and that becomes... A, a challenge and it becomes stressful and like if you if you go in so I can say from my own experience I had I had huge uh, breastfeeding issues with uh, two tongue-tied kids um, and the first I was so determined to breastfeed which I would say most people may no it's not true not most people many many people uh, statistically it's not most people many people are determined to breastfeed uh, and then there's an issue with the latch for example tongue tie and then it causes trauma so I often talk about this um, nothing is TMI here on Wombs with a View. Um, it was like somebody had taken a cheese grater to my nipple that very first latch. Um, my daughter had a very strong <laughs> tongue tie and a very strong suck. And uh, so from there, I mean, I had trauma to the nipple immediately. You can't put a baby back on that breast. So then it was the pump. And then it was trying to pump out colostrum. And I was, again, speaking to a client yesterday, and I just felt for her because it was my story. So I really tried to help her get in there with a lactation consultant so she wouldn't, you know, uh, go on and suffer with some of the same things I did. You know, then there's the, the um, what tangent am I going on here? So so very quickly, uh, you know, it was a, it was a tetrel, a, a nipple shield, which this is a whole other show. Um, uh, and then there were a few days of uh, cup feeding. And my daughter did have a bottle for a minute, just maybe for, for two days. I think we have some shots, some photos of uh, grandparents bottle feeding this little girl. Um, and, and then I wanted to very quickly get back off the bottles because I was worried about nipple confusion. We got off the bottles and then that kid nursed till she was five years old. She never took a bottle again. Um, and that was really hard for me. So I had, in the end, two children who never took a bottle, and I really try in helping uh, with the prenatal education to, okay, try to envision the plan for your next months and you know years ahead. And if you think that you would like to not be the only milk dispenser, then it can be a very, very good idea to try to, at the appropriate time, introduce the bottle. But if you miss the boat, like I, we, you know, we had that, that stuff in the beginning, but then we missed the boat, didn't get back on introducing the bottle, and that, that kid never took a bottle again. It ended up being sippy cup time. Then I could have a little bit of space to go do, 
to go do something else. So that's my uh, that's my story. And I always say, like, I probably will not have kids, but if ever I did, I would uh, I wouldn't exclusively bottle feed. I would exclusively breastfeed. I would just make sure in an appropriate time that uh, the baby was was getting some of my milk in a bottle. So you keep saying appropriate time. What does that mean? I love you. You could just answer it. <laughs> we have the same answer. I love this interview. This interview uh, back and forth today, Mika. Thank you. I, I love you too, Jenny. <laughs> awesome. So I, I think at the end, it's a family decision or, or a personal decision to make if you want to introduce a bottle at the appropriate time or not. And when we speak about appropriate time, so we do, we do treat all babies as if they have nipple confusion. And, and you said that in the beginning of our show today, that we, we want to see that breastfeeding is established. We want to give it time so um, the latch is found more easily. It's not in that, those early days where you need to constantly practice with each feed. You bring the baby to the breast and the baby kind of already knows how to uh, latch on deeply. Your milk flow is synchronized with baby's needs. And overall, in your day-to-day, -day, feeding becomes a part of it and not the main focus, which is often what happens in those early days, which is completely normal. Uh, but when breastfeeding is established, we kind of want to see, that's the word established here, we want to see that things are kind of going into a flow and there's more ease in, in the breastfeeding and the baby has learned and you have learned together how, how to do this. And, and this can take time. And often when I say three to four weeks, I get this look like what? Because <laughs> we do have this oh, at the very least, right? But that's yeah. the thing. Then you, this is the thing, is then you often slide into, or you can slide into week five or week six, and things are still not sorted out. But once we go past six weeks, that's when I see this. Oh no, we missed the boat. I mean, not where there's a will, there's a way with everything. But it's it's this really fine line between established breastfeeding and and not missing the boat. Once the, the once the ship sails, it can be very difficult to get baby to take. Uh, and this, I should, we should say, the same thing goes with the soother, right? Like we're yeah, uh, the most pacifier. most educators uh, on this subject are are a little anti soother. Again, uh, I don't feel like I or you, Mika, are anti anything. Um, again, like I have memories of being in the back seat of the car, husband driving, me with a boob in the kid's mouth because she just needed to be soothed and she didn't take she didn't suck on anything but my boob. So um, that's a that's another interesting thing is when do when could we perhaps babies need to suck point final it's part of what they need to do so if they're not sucking on you they have to be sucking on something so yeah and I why find not that a soother some babies have a stronger sucking reflex than others too and kind of recognizing what your baby has is also helpful right because not all of them are that uh, sucking um, strong or that need is not as strong. But um, where did I want to go? I wanted to say that introducing a bottle before six weeks. So between breastfeeding being established and that six-week mark where your baby, and this is me being really into neuroscience, and we know that around six weeks, so the reptilian brain has been functioning, our kind of primal basic brain as newborns is wired and connected. And around six weeks, the mammalian brain, so the limbic system comes on board, which is a social brain. So all mammals have this social connection. Eye contact and social smile will arrive around six weeks uh, for most babies. And at that time, also, we get less open to be introduced to new ways of feeding. And so the nipple confusion here can go in the other direction where we just want to have the boob and we just want to breastfeed and we refuse bottles. And that can be kind of challenging if that is something that you want to invite into your family um, daily routine to like we often, um, this comes from Rock the Cradle classes, we often recommend to our families that between four and six weeks, uh, the partner starts to give a bottle every 24 hours and to be consistent with that because once the baby has that in their routine, that repetition becomes something that teaches them uh, to take a bottle. And then moving forward in the future, you can bring in the bottle even at four in the afternoon, which is maybe not the time that the baby was used to it, but the baby knows how to take it and, and feed from it. 
and is open. Can I sweep in there and add some stuff again that we often uh, we often say to those same families and anybody who's listening and thinking about how this might apply to them. So if you were to start introducing the bottle in the way that Mika just recommended, you want to have a slow flow bottle and they're marked usually on the package. So you want the you want the uh, nipple to be appropriate for breastfeeding babies. Uh, the slow flow means that baby is having to work a little bit harder. Um, you know, not to torture them, but just to keep their their mouth. How many muscles do you say? Forty. Forty. So just to keep them still working, so that they're still going to do it. So then, if you're if if uh, the other parent is introducing the bottle, and that's an important one. Sometimes the breastfeeding um, mom has to leave leave so that the other parent can actually have any hope of introducing the bottle. That's some and advice too. It's crazy because we smell of milk when we're breastfeeding. Yeah, we just we just reek of milk. Everything smells like milk. I still feel like I smell like milk sometimes. Like, where <laughs> What is that? Oh no, it's just the ghee I rubbed all over my face. All right. So, um, but then, but then the other, um, the other part of that too is that if you inter if if that introduction happens, and then the next time you put that baby to the breast, there's fussing, and baby's like, you know, seems like he's rejecting or something weird is then happening. Then you can drop the ball a little bit with the introduction, pull back just for a day or two, and then try again. But if you're starting to see that the the introduction of the bottle is then causing issues then uh yeah and i think you can feel it you know you get so used to a certain way of latch and then you give a bottle and you bring the baby back for the next feed to the breast and the latch is different that should be a kind of a reminder oh let's let's scale down with the bottle and and focus on the breastfeeding a little longer and and then revisit it again and I just recognized that I said 4 p.m. before without giving more info about why that would be different. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm just going to add some information to that because one of the things that we highly uh, recommend just to give uh, the mamas some rest is, is to for the partners to give the bottle uh, around 10, 11 p.m. And let's say the mom goes to bed at around 9 and that can give you a nice stretch. Uh, which can be such an important addition to your schedule, kind of three, four weeks in postpartum if possible, so you get more hours of sleep in a row because you, you, know, you wake up so much for, for your newborn. So here's an opportunity uh, for everybody. It's like a win-win. The partner has an opportunity to feed. Feeding is a special moment. Uh, often when the baby's exclusively breastfed, the partner doesn't have that opportunity or the grandparents or whoever is also caring for baby. Um, so it opens up that, it opens up the opportunity for baby to have more ex techniques to feed, it opens up the opportunity for mom to rest or for the birthing person to rest. So that, that in itself uh, is just an op a thing that you can think about. And then, as I said before, once the baby knows how to take a bottle, they can take it any time. And if you need to go out for that massage or you have uh, an appointment with a pelvic floor physio at the six week mark, uh, just examples, of course, but, uh, you can basically go and feel that baby is going to be fed even when you're away, which if you're a breastfeeding person, that's huge, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like you, my kids never took bottles. My babies never took bottles. And I, I was the, the boob basically. And, um, that is which is fine place. like it's it's to be expected and like really want to say obviously Mika and I are both super you know super proponents super supporters of breastfeeding and is the, the we're often telling our, our students and, and clients and families you know the the surrender the surrendering to the fact that you're in your baby moon in that first little while and you're supposed to just chill please enjoy that chill time put on Netflix talk on Facebook whatever you need to do to just like accept the fact that you're gonna be breastfeeding for many hours in a row. Um, but that doesn't mean that you need to be, for many hours in a row, the only person able to um, get milk into your into your child after a certain point, right? So accept the fact that in the beginning, if you're a breastfeeding mom, this is what's happening. Knowing that you may find it, um, you may find that you want some room to breathe. Uh, for your own for your own mental health and I can say that as you know it's no my story is no secret suffering from or, or having been diagnosed with postpartum depression and uh, tandem nursing all night long for an extended period of time I, I don't doubt that it had something to do um, what's tandem nursing Jen 
oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I was like, take these, <laughs> take these things for granted because we were so in it for so long. But um, basically, both my kids were nursing. Uh, so I nursed throughout pregnancy. The two-year-old was still nursing. Uh, then her, her baby brother was born and he was still nursing. And my God, it just felt like everybody was nursing all the time. And we, we have this thing that we... Uh, we call being touched out, which maybe, you know, for, for various reasons, is just complete overwhelm of constantly, you know, and it, I was always wearing babies in the carrier and I loved it. But at a certain point, it would have been nice to feel like I had the liberty to go for a walk. And I probably did. You know, I probably did have that time and just, you know, mommy guilt or whatever the issue was, I just didn't take it. But certainly having children who were able to, who, who could be okay without me, um, and they they probably were. <laughs> That's a shift in, in in understanding too. But um Yeah, and let's go back to nipple confusion and kind of round it out. What what else do we want to share? Do you have any other stories or anecdotes? I mean I, I feel like I feel like the biggest harm from what I see, the biggest way that this becomes a problem is those mums who who from the get go are given a bottle in the hospital. There's a couple things that happen and you've seen it, you're in the hospitals more, hey, and doulas, doulas will come back into the hospital. This is Yay. happening, people. Sign those petitions, please. Um, uh, so uh, there are some hospitals, I, anyway, there are some hospitals who like really ram the breastfeeding down your throat that, that weird image, but like are really, really forceful with breastfeeding so that even people who intended on breastfeeding feel overwhelmed and almost like they want to reject it. There's a lot of boob grabbing. There's a lot of stuff that happens St. Mary's <clears throat> or any, you know, there, there are, are different vibes in different hospitals here in Montreal. Um, so that it's really, really forced. And then it seems like in some of the other hospitals, it's like, Oh, no acknowledgement of breastfeeding whatsoever. I had, like, I've been saying a client who, who had a, um, uh, a bad latch and was given a bottle immediately of formula in the hospital here in Montreal. And like, we know <laughs> that that is not the way to start off. What is the appropriate way if there is some trauma to the nipple or for whatever reason, if it's, you know, premature baby or cesarean birth or whatever the deal is, if we can't get milk in, if we can't get the colostrum into baby via the nipple, um, it can be expressed colostrum into, um, I'll give this one example, and then maybe you have some, some other uh, apparatus as well but a cup feeding cup putting the classroom in a little cup and yeah you know it is annoying not it, it's all a little bit frustrating the, but but thinking of cup feeding or syringe feeding as transition not as recommended anymore okay it's, talk about spoon or cup basically That's spoon or cup and, and it is like yeah. these thank you these little finicky you know things that you don't but you and know, thinking of it's transition. Too, and exactly. that, I think that's the thing with breastfeeding is getting in our minds, like if you are using, uh, if you're pumping or if you're, your manual express, whatever thing you're doing, if your goal is breastfeeding, you just looking at these things as a path and like, you're so friggin' tired. And like, I, I know I remember the fog, but just like, okay, this is not my forever. This will pass. It's a this is just for stone. now. It's a yeah, stepping exactly. stone that will bring you to the pond or to the river where things will flow. <laughs> and, and having support, if any of these things show up for you, is the key. And, and we always say that in our classes, like everything we can teach you now, the most important thing, have a few phone numbers, know that, reach out to your doula, find a lactation consultant, have those numbers ready because mm -hmm. even a little support will go such a long way. And if you don't know where to find that support, come back to us. We are no no strangers on the internet. Um, wanted to say that we have, uh, as some of you know, Mika and I are always teaching uh, hypnobirthing classes. We have more classes coming up soon. Uh, in we July. Also, in July. Um, uh, I, I said soon because I couldn't remember the date, but Mika is usually a little bit more date. Do you know what date it is? oriented <laughs> now you're putting me on the spot jenny <laughs> you're on the spot that's why i said soon july okay we but have it written do. somewhere it's easy to find i know but i'm just gonna say i do remember the date of our free info session for hypnobirthing it's coming up on june 17th and then uh, every thursday in july that's us you know just 
Every th- that's that. what it is. Every Thursday in July <laughs> is our hypnobirthing <laughs> classes. You can email us at hypnobirthingmontreal.com. Uh, there's also a phone number up on our uh, our Facebook page and up on our website. Uh, and Mika and I also teach, aside from hypnobirthing, we do teach the classes with Rock the Cradle, um, where we both work as doulas along with Sylvia and Ida. And uh, we have uh, I'm teaching those classes coming up in June, starting on the 13th. It's three days. So the Rock the Cradle prenatal education classes and the hypnobirthing classes are both amazing and both totally different. So we invite you to discover uh, what might be best for you by uh, by reaching out. You can check out either of those two websites or you can come and find Nico or myself uh, online. Wonderful. Great, thank you. Thanks and please leave your comments, your stories. I'm sure there are lots of stories of nipple confusion. We can laugh, right? Like we can't really laugh when we're in it. You know, when we're when we're trying to learn how to breastfeed and, you know, there's blood on our nipples, not super funny. I can tell you 10 years later, I'm all I'm all right about it. Now I've, uh, you know, now now I look back to those cheese grater moments and no, it's still not funny. It's not funny, but it's lighter now because I'm not in it and I sleep. Yeah. Sleep goes a long way. <laughs> it does. Thank you, everybody, for watching the show. So Mika will be back in two weeks time. Yeah, with Valerie Neymar. She's an osseo and she is, she's amazing. She does so many things. And one of her expertise is how to um, basically, when you come for an osteo treatment right after giving birth, how to treat both the birth giver, both the parent or the woman, however you, um, now I'm blocked for a moment, but however you, <laughs> you see yourself showing up, and, uh, and the baby. So uh, instead of just focusing on one, she's also focusing, or the other, she's focusing on the relationship. What a I treat. Think. Amazing. That's and amazing. when we talk, listen, when we're talking about issues with breastfeeding, uh, often body, body work with uh, somebody like Val is a very, very good idea. So thank you guys so much for watching, and, uh, and Mika, we'll see you in two weeks' time.